And then this is what happens in Acts 4, verse 31. It says, as after they had prayed, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they bravely spoke God's message. And so genero- generosity began to mark God's people. And the vehicle, the catalyst, the thing that started the whole thing off is the Holy Spirit. Filled with God's Holy Spirit, they begin to boldly preach the message of Jesus, and they begin to express radical generosity. So generosity, the point is this, generosity is empowered by God. It's not something that you and I thought of, right? You're not that smart. I'm not that smart. Like, we just didn't think of it. Our generosity is only, just like our devotion, it is only in response to God's generosity to us. Our generosity is only in understanding what God has done in his son on our behalf. So God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his son. He, gave, he went all in. Jesus lays his life down for me and for you. And our generosity pales in comparison to the generosity of God, but it's in response. And generosity is a mark that God's working in and through you. And it doesn't mean that if you don't believe in Jesus or if you don't have a shared conviction in who God is, that you can't be generous or you can't do generous things. You can it just means that if you were dead to an old life, like if you were, if you were your old self, your old fleshy self, I don't know, like, like for me, for example, uh, you know, have a tendency to be pretty selfish. Make it about you, what you want, your agenda, when you want it, that type of mindset. But when you come alive in Christ, all of a sudden he changes your perspective on who he is, on who you are, and who the people around you are. So now all of a sudden... What well, used to be just only about you, you begin to give yourself over to the things of God. And you care more about serving people, more about being generous, more about helping people than you used to. That's the whole idea. And again, it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so verse 31, it says this. It says, after they prayed, the meeting place shook. They're filled with the Holy Spirit and bravely spoke God's message. And it's just a reminder that So there's this cause and effect right before the early church is generous. They're empowered by the Holy Spirit and that generosity is not natural. It's supernatural. Grace is not natural. It's supernatural. And this is the reason why the Apostle Paul says you need to grow in the grace of giving because it's a grace. It's not normal. Like if you're experiencing a desire to like help people or serve people or be more generous, like that's God doing a profound work in and through your life when he gives you over to what he cares about, which is others. And so generosity is empowered by God. God starts this whole thing off. And then look at verse 32. Here's the next one. It says, all the believers were one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. So generosity is marked by unity. There's this unity that's marked by generosity. Why is it? Why? Because because Jesus is a compelling vision, and they're willing to go all in with that vision. And we usually like to spend our money and our time and our resources and our energy on things that are compelling. So you're passionate about that hobby, or you invest in that thing, or you spend time or energy or money on things that you really love and that you're after that are compelling. And Jesus is a compelling vision. So all these groups of people, like all these people from different tribes, from different groups, from different backgrounds, different bins, all of them come together in Christ. Why? Because he's a compelling vision. And so um, that's what God's calling us to do as a church family is to fix our eyes on Jesus. And if you want real unity, just look at Jesus. Like, that's, that's our, what's our message? Jesus is our message. It's our first value as a church. Jesus is our message. And a lot of churches, struggle, if they're struggling in the area of unity, it's because their message has shifted and drifted away from the thing that brings people together, which is Jesus. You want uncommon unity? Get back to Jesus. That's what it's about. And so this is what we see in the early church. And some, if you've ever been a part of, like, a, a church meeting, maybe back in the day, I don't know if you were part of business church meetings back in the day, but if you've ever experienced, like, a church split or church, you know, like just, just hard things, you know what I mean? And it's usually from people who are, who are struggling with the fact that they're not getting their way, have a desire for control. Hey, you don't understand. I've been here longer. Hey, that's my pew. That type of mindset, like we want green carpet, whatever. Like, but there's the business meeting where things begin to pop off. It's like if you've been to Black Friday, I don't know if you, how many of y'all been to Black Friday? You shopped on Black Friday, confession time, but they shopped on Black Friday. And uh, for some of you, it's an Olympic sport. You're like, bro, let's go. Post, uh, post Thanksgiving, woo, you get like in that athletic gear and you're like ready and you just hit the doors and you're like, I'm going to punch somebody out for a PS5. It's not worth it. Like the 45-inch the screen TV, I'm just going to race, get the 45-inch screen TV, 
a lot of times you end up with stuff that nobody even really wants to begin with, that $29 blender nobody's going to use. Like, it's like, it's a good deal. It's like you woke up at 3 to go buy stuff we'll never use. But anyway, so, but, but it's that moment, it's that moment of, man, I got to get mine. That type of mindset is where most people live. And what we see the early church is there's just radical generosity and unity because it did not matter. Like, literally, if Jesus is who he says he is, if we've experienced a resurrected Christ, if we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, if this is real, who cares? <laughs> who cares what, like, who gets credit or who owns what or who drives what? And they're like, are you kidding me? So they're all in on this message, and I would love it. Here's what I feel like we should do with Black Friday. We should go to Black Friday and, like, run and race and get, like, the last whatever. And then, like, look at the person who, like, we beat to it and be like, I'm giving this to you. Like, we should just be like, we should just be like, we should fight for generosity. Because people who are generous don't tend to have a ton of conflict. Like, nobody's mad at people who are generous. You know what I mean? Like, no, I'm going to buy your meal. No, you, no, I'm going to buy your meal. You know, it's like you're not angry. You're, like, blessed by people whenever that happens. And I love it so much. Generous people tend to get along with others. Generous people tend to build more unity because generous people know, they know what's not about them. And I'll tell you the people who at our church family who here at Soma, people who are most unified, most sold out to the vision of what God's doing are usually the people who are most generous. And it's because they have the most equity, the most ownership, the most desire to see God move in powerful ways. Those are ones who, 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 and who generally lean pretty heavy on it. Hey, my time, my talent, my treasure, dream team. And I know for many of you, I'm preaching to the choir. But I'm putting my weight on this thing, and I desire for it to go forward because I want to see God move in a mighty way. And so when you focus on other people, here's the hack. When you focus on other people and you make it about, God, I really desire for you to use me in powerful ways, and you get the focus off of you, it is never a waste. Amen. It's never a waste of your time or your talent or your treasure when it's not about you. When it feels like a waste is when you made it about you. So when you get mad and upset is when you made it about you. And when, when we struggle with disunity is when we made it about us. And so again, if, 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 if you feel yourself drift in that space, it's like, hey, how can I get my eyes fixed back again where they belong on Jesus, about his message, his agenda, his mission, and then make it about the thing that really matters, that lasts forever. And so if you walk into a gathering here at Soma, the thing I love about it is we, we're a church family of different ages and races and men and women and young and old and white and black and poor and rich and Democrat and Republican and independent and, uh, you know, essential oil fanatics. And we got extreme couponers. We got hunters and we got vegans. Shout out to the hunting season. We got any hunters up in this? Up in this? Yes coming alive and so we got every, we got Carolina fans we got any Carolina fans in the room we got any Duke fans in the room we got any App State fans in the room do we have any NC State fans in the room it's so hard to be a state fan so it's like I went to NC State God bless you okay so so like but we're all different like all coming from different backgrounds all different bins different passions and God is building a family that does not look normal people walk in and go why are you hanging out Jesus and so the thing that will, that will humble everything that you used to divide over, Jesus will bring uncommon unity. And I believe that our impact as a church, if we stay united on that vision, here's the vision, Jesus. If we stay united on the message that is Jesus, I promise you what God does is going to blow your mind if we will stay united around that vision. He, he desires to not only do a great work here locally, but regionally. He desires to not only do a great work, like, because some of you are watching God do a great work in other people's lives, and you think it's just for them. It's for you, too. It's for your marriage. It's for your home. It's for your provision. It's for your healing. It's for your spiritual breakthrough. It's for every bit, like, it's for you, too. And not only is he going to work uh, a, a mighty work here, but he's going to do a great work. Uh, it's going to spill into other cities. It's going to spill into other states. It's going to spill into other nations. If we st and the reason why I know that is because this is what he does. It's not even about a particular brand or, or a, a local expression or any of that. It's just what he does. We will be ascending church. We'll begin because we, we, we won't be able to help ourselves. Like it'll be a message. It's like, please, let's just go share that junk everywhere. Let's give. Let's provide. Let's be the church to the ends of the earth. This is what he calls us to do. 
verse 33. Look at verse 33. It says this. It says, with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the, to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So generosity is for the mission of God. So it's empowered by God. It is marked by unity. But the reason why he even desires to move through you and your generosity is for his mission, for his agenda. That's it. The whole reason why he used generosity in the early churches so that they would have a part to play, it was a commission. You have a part to play. It's just obedience. Hey, what's your portion? Cool. Everybody bring it. Awesome. Lay it down to help advance my cause and my mission. It's all about his mission because people looked at the early church and they were like, what is that? That's crazy. So verse 33, here's what's so great. Uh, Verse 33 talks about the mission of God. It says they were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus with great power. But 33 is sandwiched in between 32 and 34. And I don't think it's on on accident. It's like a generosity sandwich. And in the mid, the meat is the gospel. And here's the verse, here's 32. It says, no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Real heart change. Look at verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were landowners or houses sold and brought the proceeds to what was sold. Went from heart change to tangible love expressed in the form of who needs what. And, and in the middle of all that, crazy good news is being preached to people. And people are like, they talk a good game. They're also wild. Those people are wild. They're crazy. So like radical generosity marks the early church. And so their giving was centered on the good news of who Jesus is and their proximity to the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit is what drives the entire thing. So if you feel like you're struggling in the area of generosity, you got to get tighter to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus and you got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what you can't do in your own strength or your own flesh. Because we all have, we all have, we're all growing in this area. So you could crush this, by the way, and have like a spiritual gift here and still have room for growth. Because God's not broken. He desires to do incredible things in and through you. He wants to use you as like a vessel. And basically, uh, biblical finances, biblical stewardship, and and all of this is like God desires to move in mighty ways. He wants to use willing vessels to do his work in and through the world. The giving in the early church is is, is to forward the message, the mission, and the ministry of Jesus. And this is something that on a practical side... I mean, if you run, let's say you're a part of a business, if you own a company, it takes money to run the company, okay? If you have a family, hello, it takes money to feed your kids. Can I get an amen? Can I get a witness from anybody in the room? Um, and, if, it, and if we're doing ministry and if we're, like, meeting the needs of people and if we're the local church, it takes money, resources, provision in order to advance the vision that God has for his house, and this is what we see in the early church, but sometimes we forget it. And so the question is, how do we make it go viral the way that the early church made it go viral? And at Soma, we want as many people as possible to hear about Jesus. And we're privileged to live in a space and a time where it's easier than ever to get messaging out. But we also live in a space and a time where people don't care. So globally, church is growing, crushing. In America... Not so much. It depends, on, it depends on what your message is. If your message is Jesus and you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, those churches are smacking right now. But in general, the American church is in decline, mainline, and people who have kind of mission drifted or not focused on the main thing or just forgot. People who I have conversations with, this is so depressing. But, like, locally, there's other leaders in other ministries locally. And we can't even agree that, that, that the Great Commission is, like, a thing. And it's like, I don't understand What's happening? Like, I'm so, like, depressed that, like, wait, we can't degree on, like, sharing Jesus with people? This is weird. And so, but here's the, so here's what we see. In general, the local church has, in, in America, okay, in America, um, has less impact. And part of the reason why it has less impact is because less and less people are willing to put their weight on it. Less and less people are willing to get behind it. This is Barna, because y'all are going to think I'm making this up. But this is Barna. They did a study last year. All they do is studies, like Pew Research studies, like uh, church studies, basically. And they said 21% of all Christians in America tithe. 9%, 8%, and 37%, those are a group of people that would say, hey, I give something, but it kind of, like, it's not tithing, and it's just whatever. 25% would say, I don't give anything. I'm a Christian. I believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 
I just don't want anybody to know it. That's wild. And then practicing Christians and non-practicing Christians, which I think are amazing categories, because I'm like, what is even a non-practicing Christian? Like, what is that? But so let's just say, <laughs> those are just wild categories to me. I'm like, you either are or you're not. So, uh, but anyway, this is the breakdown of like, we, we're driving 100% of the mission off of 21% of the givers. And it's like, what would it look like if we would just go like this, what would it look like if everybody was like, you know what? I can't pay their portion. I can't play their part. I can't serve the way that they can. I don't have their gifts. I definitely don't have their time. I don't have their resources, but I got what I got. Let's go all in and let's build what God's building. Generosity is for the mission of God. The story of where we are as a church family and the unique grace that we've experienced, even in this five-year period, is because of other people's generosity. So we started strong because other people were generous before we started. And, and we're continuing to do what we're doing just to brag on Dream Team and those of you who are already doing the thing. Like, because people were willing to just, like, get after it and get excited about the things of God. And, and, and let me say this. It's a journey. Because some of you are stressed out. You're like, man, I just got here. Bro, I invited a friend. He's never this angry. You know, like, I, but so, like, it's a journey and it's a process of like learning to follow Jesus, of, of going all in, of taking a next step and following him. You're not going to look like him like tomorrow, but like it, by God's grace, in 10 years from now, you'll look way different than you look right now. And your capacity and your fulfillment and your impact and everything is going to grow as you're willing to, to put more of yourself on the truth of who God is. And so Here's the vehicle that God has to accomplish his mission. This is the vehicle that God has decided in his providence to accomplish his mission in the earth. You. There is no plan B. And it's not a building. And it's not a system. And it's not a program. And it's not like, okay, cool, we've got the governance. And like, no one cares. It's you. You are the church. And you're, his mis- you're the vehicle that he has to accomplish his mission in the earth. You're the vehicle that he chooses to use so that your fam- family member and your friends and the people who, in- who are in your life who are far from God, he wants to use you in order to bring people close. And God is primarily focused on those who are not here. So, like, if you look at the life and the testimony and the witness and the ministry of Jesus, he is the shepherd that leaves 99 for the one. He's after the lost coin. He's after the, 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 par- the prodigal son. He's after the one who's not in the room. And if you're a follower of Jesus, your whole life, the mission of Christ is to help people who desperately know, like, hey, I'm sick and I'm broken and I need a Savior and I need a Lord and I need a physician and I need to be made right. I can't do it in my own strength. Not for people who think they have it all together. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's good. That's gospel. So, so um, this is what God's chosen to do. For those of us who give to the mission of what God's trying to accomplish in the earth, this is what it's about. The early church was marked by radical generosity, and I believe that God's calling us to leverage what we have to help advance his agenda with even more urgency. Um, part of the reason why it worked is because they understood that they didn't own it to begin with that they were stewards. And a big part, part of our issues, part of my, me, my own issues historically has been a change in mindset from an owner to a steward. Look at verse 32. No one said that they had any of the things that belonged to him was their own, but they had everything in common. And so it reminds me of the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Jesus gives the story and he's talking about stewardship, but he's also talking about eternity. And Jesus is talking about the judgment seat of Christ in Matthew 25. So you and I, when we step out of this life and into the next, there's a great white throne judgment that I believe that Jesus was who he says he was, that I surrender my life to Christ. And then there's the judgment seat of Christ, which is like, cool, you're in eternity, you're in heaven, awesome. And then God rewards you for what you did with what he gave you. And so Jesus takes inventory of your entire life and then rewards you, the Bible tells us, judgment seat of Christ. And this is what he's talking about in Matthew 25. He says, he said, let me tell you a story about a master, about a manager. And he had three guys that worked for him, three servants. And he said, he gave one guy five bags of gold. He gave one guy two bags of gold. He gave another guy a bag of gold. He said, I'm getting ready to leave, getting ready to head out. I'm going to be back when I come back. Uh, I want you to invest that while I'm gone. I want you to steward it. I want you to manage it, sow it. I, w- I want to see a return on what I gave you when I get back. He gets back. The guy with five bags got five more. Guy with two bags, he has two more. 
master looks at him and says this. He says, his master replied, Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. And I love that because in that verse it says, he doesn't say, I'm going to give you more stuff. He says, hey, you've been faithful with the things I've given you. Time, talent, treasure, relationships, all that I gave you. Now I'm getting ready to give you more responsibility. I'm getting ready to let you have a greater impact yes, sir. By, for my name. Like I'm getting ready to, in my name, I'm getting ready to let you make a difference in people's lives. You're going to experience more fulfillment, but it's not, so much, it's not about the stuff. I'm just getting ready to give you over uh, to more responsibility. And then there's one guy who, who has the one bag, and he decides, I'm freaking out. I don't want to do anything with this. I'm gonna, so he just buries it in the ground, doesn't invest it, doesn't sow it, doesn't do anything with the gift that the master's given him. Hey, it's mine to steward. I'm not doing anything with it. He comes back. He's, he's like, what have you done? He takes his bag, gives it the, to the guy who has 10. He says this in verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance from those who do nothing. Even what they have will be taken away. And so uh, the, the problem is, for a lot of us, is we don't think like stewards. We think like owners. And we also just aren't super intentionality with our time. Again, I'm not talking just money. I'm talking like every area of life. Your time, your relationships, your talents, your res- everything. And, and we don't operate out of, out of a place of intentionality. So we'll live financially. We'll live like this. Hey, what do I have to live off of? And then maybe I can save something, and then I'll give whatever's left over. And then there's some people who teach the opposite of this, and they'll say, hey, you know what? Let's reverse it. Let's give, and then I'll save, and then I'll live. And I think the biblical principle, the imperative that I see in Scripture is this. Let me bring, and then I'm going to give, and then I'm going to save, and then I'm going to live. Let me bring the tithe. I'm basically just returning to God what's his. The Bible tells you that every good and perfect gift in your life is from God. So, and I'm just telling you scripture. So it's like, you can go and argue with him in your own time. But it's like, what about the house that he gave me and the family that he gave me? What about that breath I just took? Like, what about everything amazing in my life? He gave it to me to steward. What am I doing with it? And am I investing in sowing and, and giving my life over to the thing that matters ultimately to him, which is others, advancing his name, his agenda, his mission in the earth, and making it about those who are far from him, that they would come into relationship with him. But this is what we see as the biblical principle of tithing. And, hey, I can give an offering above and beyond. Because the Holy Spirit was so cool about this. Is there is a, There's a principle of the tithe. But then the Holy Spirit would just ask you to be generous just like randomly. Like, hey, go buy her groceries. You know, single mom, two kids, she's in the store. Or, hey, you know, uh, you're empty nester. You got four cards. You don't need it. Like, hey, just give that car to that person who needs a car. They're a broke joker in college. And he, you know, like whatever. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit will give you actionable items to what God's calling you to do. But then saving, part of the reason why we're positioned as a church to be able to move on the building is because we had already saved close to half a million dollars. Now, we weren't stingy. We still tithed. We still gave. We still did the things that God asked us to do. But our operating operating budget was built so that we had the margin, the financial margin, to be able to move when God positioned us to do it. And then uh, we've been able to make an impact, a kingdom impact. And so look at verse 34. It says, there was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of land or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid them at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to each as they had need. So generosity is others-focused. And this goes along with the other one. It's the mission of God, and here is the mission of God, others. It's others-focused. Right before verse 34, it says that these people were of one heart and one soul, and God did a work on the inside of them, and then their love for one another became tangible in the form of generous giving. So just generosity is this love expressed, really, basically. And if you want to know what you love, just look at what you give to. Like, honestly, that online banking statement will convict you so hard. Like, I love that a lot. You know, like, but whatever you love, you just, what do I give my, look at your calendar. What do I give my time to? What do I give my headspace to? What do I give my emotional equity to? What do I give my resources to? Whatever it is that you love, that's what you give to. And so, and I know because I see faces all day long. Talking about money makes people so uncomfortable. People, people are like, oh, shh, don't look at me. You know what I mean? Like, just look somewhere. Or money or sex. Those two things in general, like, people are like, hey, don't talk to me about my sexuality. Don't talk to me about my money. You can lord over most of my life. Just don't hit those two things, okay? But it, and even in the church, 
um, that's our mindset. But Jesus says this in Matthew 6. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And, and I used to read that only as, hey, wherever my money is, that's what I love, and it would make me super depressed. And it can make you super depressed. Or you can make it super practical, which means, hey, whatever you invest in, your heart grows in affection towards. So if, you're, if your marriage is struggling, invest in it. And if, you're, if you're, uh, your lack of purpose is, is struggling, invest in it. And if certain relationships, or if your kids, relationship with your kids are struggling, invest in it. Like give yourself over to the things that you love and, or, or that you want to love more and watch your affection grow for those things. And so the same thing is true for your relationship with Christ. If you want to grow in your affection for Jesus, begin to give, give yourself over to time, talent, and treasure to the things of God. And then watch your affection for God grow as you do that. And this is what Je I mean, this is not, I'm not making it up. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 6. And that's why we love givers. Oh, we love givers. Everybody loves a good giver. Like, when was the last time you hung out with somebody who's generous, who's generous and you were like, man, I hate them. They're just so, I just buy my food all the time. It's just like, you know what I mean? They're just verbally affirming. They're just, you know, like, I just, I don't like hanging out with them. They buy me stuff. Like, no one says that. So everybody loves generous people. And that's the reason why people who, who are the best spouses are givers. People who make the best parents are givers. People who make the best friends are givers. That's the reason why employees, if you, if you got a team of people, man, the one who's willing to give themselves over to the work, like they're the best employee. Uh, church people, like anything, because they love big and they love well through generosity. And so uh, it matters for us as a church because we don't want to obligate people to do things. And so many of you, you're operating with a mindset of like, just dead religion. Like, I've got to do certain things, and if I don't do these things, instead of operating out of a mindset, again, you're only generous because God was first generous to you. And until you realize what has been done on your behalf, it's really hard to manage it in your own flesh. It's like, man, I'm just, I'm going to read my Bible because I have to. And, you know, I'm just, I'm going to go to church so they don't judge me because this is the South and everybody judges, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just going to go to church. I'm going to do a group so he'll shut up about it. He keep talking about groups. He's looking at me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going like, to give because now I feel obligated because he gave a message. And none of that will work and none of that will hit. The only thing that hits is if you have a heart change. And because uh, God doesn't want you to give out of a place of compulsion. He doesn't want to, he don't want, he don't want you to give out of a place of obligation. It just doesn't. And, and it doesn't work because some of you have done that before. And then you're frustrated that you didn't get certain things out of it because you gave out of a place of compulsion instead of out of, as an act of worship. And so uh, I think there's a place for obedience. And I think there's a place for doing things simply because God said to do them. Um, and so, like, for example, discipline and disciple, like those are coming from the same root word. you got to have discipline. But I believe that obedience and discipline give way to joy. And I believe that God doesn't want you to stay in a place where you simply do things because it's the right thing to do, but because he gives you over to fulfillment as you do them. And so it's Christian hedonism. God's most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in him as I do the things that he's called me to do. Like, that's, that's the message of Jesus. That's what hits so hard. And some of us are like, I just got to do all the things. I just got to be good enough. You are not good enough, okay? And you won't be good enough. Instead of, man, God loves me in this wild that he loves me the way that he loves me. And I got to get that on me, and I got to realize that, and then my life will begin to reflect it. So God wants you to fall in love with him, and he wants you to move from duty to delight. And from the things that I have to do, now I get to do them. It's the reason why our values are generosity is my joy, and serving is my privilege. And, and because these are things that we ascribe to, these are values that we desire for ourselves. Hey, we would love to move to a place where God, God has changed my heart in such a way that serving is not like, it's the thing I get to do. Washing feet is like, are you kidding? I get to do this? And so uh, this, is, this is the heart of God. This is what he wants for his people. And some of you are super depressed right now because you're thinking, I'm just not generous. Like, I'm just not. I just like things and myself way too much. But here's the good news. The Apostle Paul says this in Philippians 2.13. He says, for God's working in you, giving you both the desire and the power to do what pleases him. If you don't hear anything else I say today because you tuned me out because I'm talking about money, write that one down. Philippians 2.13 is good news. It means that the same God who saved you 
is also the one who's doing the heavy lifting in your sanctification. He gives you both the desire to change and then the power. What's, you're like, well, what do we even do? Obedience. That's all you do. You just do the next thing that God's asked you to do. What did he ask you to give? Where did he ask you to serve? What is he, who did he ask you to tell his message of hope? Like, hey, here's what Jesus has done in my life. What's the thing that he's asking you to do? Just do that. And then he'll give you both the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Because you can't get there in your own strength. You cannot. And some of you are trying and you're so frustrated with the Christian life. You're like, I'll try a new church to see if it. And it's, and it's just that you're trying to do things instead of realizing how much he loves you. And, and it's, it's only out of the overflow of that. And so look at, the, look at, this is the last part of this passage, verses 34 through 37. It says, brought, they brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. Those jokers brought everything they got, put it in the pile, and was like, all right, Lord, you're in charge. Look, look at this. Uh, this one guy, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. I love that Barnabas gets a shout-out. This is like a big deal back in the day. You know, a lot of your wealth is wrapped up in, like, you know, it's agricultural economy. So they're like, hey, shout-out to Barnabas, you know. like he, and so, But they brought it all, and then they said, all right, God, do your thing. And, and, and so it's just a reminder that generosity is about trusting God. So giving is about trusting God. And uh, they collected resources. They brought it to these local leaders, these people who were so tight to the resurrection of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit was so evident that these people, these people were willing to sell everything they had and be like, that's crazy. Like Jesus walking around is crazy. Also 5,000 people coming to faith in Christ over a couple month period. Also, that dude was lame, and now he's no longer lame. Things are, things are wild. What do, we, what do we need to sell? You know what I mean? And so God was moving in such a mighty way that their generosity was in response to that. Their trust for what God could do was in response to that. And, uh, and for some of us, I just want to say a lot of our generosity, it's all a heart issue. But for a lot of us, it's like a trust thing. Like, Okay, if I actually do bring a tithe or if I actually do give first before I save, before I live, like, I don't know if I've got enough. And if you don't do it when you have $100, you'll never do it when you have 100000 Promise. I promise. It's real hard. It's harder, you know. But if you, if you live out the principles in advance, you go, God, I trust you with what you've given me. And I'm willing to steward it. And I'm willing to be a vessel. And I'm willing to be a vehicle for your mission. And for some of you, it's not that you don't trust God. It's that you don't trust, like, the issue, the issue isn't God. The issue is people. And you're like, I've been burnt. Bro, we did this campaign this one time, and it was shady. Or, we, did, you know, like, whatever your thing is, church history, there's some baggage there. And I understand all that. And that's legitimate. And we want to do it, everything that we can as a church family to make sure that we have integrity in the area of giving, to make sure that we're stewarding resources, to make sure that we have a covering. There's a board of trustees that literally set agenda and budgets and my salary. We can't purchase land or buildings or any of that kind of stuff. We, don't, we only move in, in, in unanimous vote. We don't, there's no like, we don't like break a vote. We don't even vote. We're just like, pray about it. If we're doing it, we're doing it. If we're not, we're not. And it's, on, it's, it's these guys running the thing. Because your boy, I like talking about Jesus. I ain't good with data. I ain't good with spreadsheets. You know what I'm saying? I don't have like an accounting degree. Many members, one body. Everybody's got gifts. Come on, let them do their thing. And so we even have overseers as a church, people who we model a lot after on the financial end, who are light years ahead of us, who operate with margin, pays cash for crazy things that God's doing because they have. And so those are the types of things that we're doing for integrity's sake. But I just want to encourage you that, uh, that for Brooke and I, as we've, like, as, as we've been a part of different church families and, and different things over the course of our life, anytime we gave to what, like, what we knew God was asking us to give and we didn't make it about us, it was never wasted. Even when we didn't benefit directly. Even when maybe that leadership changed. Even when, hey, you know what? They said they were going to do this, but they ended up doing this. Even when, like, it didn't matter. We never looked at it and went, you know what? Those thousands of dollars that we gave to that thing when we were making one income on ministry salary, like, we never looked at that and thought, man, I wish those people wouldn't have come to faith in Christ. I wish those people wouldn't have gotten baptized. I wish we wouldn't have launched that location where we didn't benefit directly, but wow, look at what God did. We never thought that. 
And so at some point, we just have to go, God, I just trust you to do what only you can do. And I've got a part to play in a portion, and I want to participate in my way. But I need you to do what only you can do on the inside of me to grow me in the grace of giving. And we all have room for, for growth in this area, just like every other area. And so as we close today, just ask that question. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? I want to look more like, I want to get as close as I can to the resurrection of Jesus. I want to get as close as I can to just what we see in the early church, what marked them with this radical generosity and this bold witness to who Jesus is. And, and so would you remind me? Some of you need to be reminded. Some of you never heard it before. But, uh, man, God so loves you that he gave his son. Like he gave, Jesus gave himself over for you and paid the penalty for your sins and for my sins. And then we mentally assent to that some, sometimes and we'll say, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. But like our lives need to reflect the reality of his resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, like, yeah, have wisdom and discernment. Yeah, have good practices, but also just, like, be bold and just, like, do what God's asking you to do in service to others, making Jesus famous. We have one message as a church, Jesus. That's it. The whole reason why we're doing what we're doing is so that you would come into a relationship with him, so that you would find freedom that he's already paid for, so that you would discover the purpose that he created before you were even born. And so that you could come alive in real fulfillment and joy in, in making a difference in the lives of others, which is helping them to know who Jesus is. So this is our mission as a church. This is what it's all about. And uh, I know some of you are like, man, Acts 4, come on. Like, really? We're hitting the giving thing so hard today. What's in Acts 5? Y'all know what? Acts 5 is where, uh, Acts 5, there's a couple, oh, there's a couple who lied about their giving, didn't, you know, and anyway, they end up dead. And I'm not, we're not, we're not going to hit that. We don't have time for that. Um, I'm not saying God will kill you if you don't get it. I'm just saying there's a biblical precedent for them. I'm just saying. But, but what, seriously, next week, we're not going to hit Acts 5. Read it on your own time. It's, it's raw. But, uh, but, I, but listen, just pray about it and just say, God, would you grow me in, in the area of generosity? And would you empower me to do what only you can do? Would you help me to stay focused on your mission and on others? God, I, I just need, I need more of what you have for me. And as you do it, here's what's so cool. You'll experience more fulfillment, more joy, and more impact. And I just believe that. Having done it myself, like you'll, you'll come alive all the more. You'll look more like Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for the opportunity to gather around it and be reminded of um, how much you love us and how much you gave. And God, the early church just really reflects. It's just a, um, a, a realization of, of all that you've done on our behalf and help us as a community of faith do the same thing. God, help us in our relationships and help us with our calendar. God, help us with our, our, our grace and our, our patience. God, help us with our emotional equity and our, our abilities and our, even our resources. God, every aspect of who we are, help us to grow in generosity and not make it about us, but just God, give us over to your mission and your vision. Help us to love you in response to how much you love us and really love others well. And, and, and we make that love tangible in the form of giving. So would you help us to take inventory, Holy Spirit, of where our treasure is? Because that's where our heart is. And for everybody in this room, God, I know we desire more of you. And I know we desire to grow in our affection for you. Would you give us the courage of conviction to be able to lean more be able to trust more. Thank you for giving us everything. Thank you for giving us this life. Thank you for giving us our families. Thank you for giving these relationships to us, God, opportunities and uh, provision and the place that we work, God, the house that we have, the, the toys that you give us, God, the everything, every, every good and perfect gift in our life is from you. And, and help us to be mindful of that and just worship you and in service to you, give our lives over to what you're about. 
If you're here and you've never come alive in Christ, you've never surrendered your life fully to Jesus, you never have a moment where you realize who you are in relationship to him. It's not about uh, doing better and it's not about good works on your behalf or things in your own strength or flesh. It's about what Jesus has done on your behalf and then surrendering your life over to that. Man, I'm only generous in response to God's generosity. So Jesus came and he lived a perfect life so that he could give you over to his status of perfection. When God sees you as his child, as a son or daughter in Christ, he sees you as perfect because Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus died in your place to offer you forgiveness of sins and the grace that we didn't deserve. Grace is unnatural, supernatural, and God gives us over to grace in Christ. But he also gives us over, because he raised himself from the dead, he, he also gives us over to this resurrected life that we don't deserve, this eternal life with him, this right relationship with God by way of Jesus. So if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to surrender your life to him, you want to come alive in him, experience salvation, I, I would love for you, as we pray, and our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're here, I would love for you to just confess him as Lord. A simple way to do that is just raise your hand in the room and just say, I'm confessing Jesus as Lord. I need everything that he paid for. I need all that he wants for me. Amen. Amen. Yeah, just a moment for you to confess him. Hey, I confess. I'm tired of trying to do things in my own strength. Awesome. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Just a moment for you to just say, hey, I need... Jesus, I need you. If that's you and you're praying that prayer, just right where you are, just say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying in my place. God, thank you for taking my sins, past, present, and future. And um, I want a new identity in you today. God, I'm so tired of trying to do this in my own strength. I'm so tired of trying to manage my own sin. I'm so tired of shame and fear plaguing my life. I want freedom in you. I want forgiveness. I want the grace that you offer. And so I grab hold of it today, and, and I'm, I'm agreeing that it's there for me to grab hold of. And I, and I just want to praise you for who you are. I want to give my life in response to, for you giving yours for me. I want to give my life over to you, and I want, I want what you want for me. So would you lord over my life? Thank you for being my Savior, but now would you lord over my life? Lead me moving forward by your word and by your spirit. God, root me in a, in a group of people in a church family who love you and who love me, who want great things for me. Help me to find community and, and learn what it means to follow you moving forward. God, we're so grateful. Do the same thing in all of our lives. Stir our affection and our hope for you. God, give us over to generosity that looks like this early church. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen. Church, church family, can we make it up for anybody who's made the decision to follow Jesus and give their lives to him? Let's stand to our feet. If we can stand to our feet.